English composer Rafe Vaughan Williams wrote a song cycle using poems by Robert Louis Stevenson called Songs of Travel. In this collection of nine songs, the audience follows the journey of a person wandering the roads of life. The first in the series, entitled The Vagabond, begins with a musical motif that depicts the bold steps of an eager traveler whose only wish as he sings is for the heaven above and the road before him. Perhaps we can relate to that if we've ever stepped out on our own. The singer moves us through his journey, his new appreciation for all that which lies ahead of him. As he journeys, he laments his lost youth and yearns for time that is long past. We then move to his dreams, the music melancholy and sad. He remembers a lost love, and he sings, In dreams unhappy I behold you stand. This road we travel is lined with those whom we leave behind. Each step at times is heavier than the last. Whole seasons of our lives can be this way. And then seasons pass. And from there, our traveler appreciates what he calls the infinite and shining heavens. And he sings an ode to all those things which may never die, namely music and love. In the penultimate song, Whither Must I Wander, strong is the melody and wistful the mood, not unlike us in the twilight of our lives. The singer reflects on the life he's lived, the everyday those things at, at home which come to him no more, and he makes a hopeful peace. In the last song, he's reached the end of his journey. The musical motif from the first song returns, though altered and more subdued. Melodies from the other songs find their way in as he sings, I have trod the upward and the downward slope. I have endured and done in days before. I have longed for all and bid farewell to hope. And I have lived and loved and closed the door. Often, tales of an epic journey are romanticized, but I find that these Louis Stevenson poems set to music by the prolific Vaughn Williams bring some reality to the roads we walk. Our lives are a journey down a well-traveled road, and we follow in the footsteps of those who have gone before. We encounter other travelers along the way, some of whom join us for a part of the journey. Ultimately, though, we each carry a particular and unique experience through this world, and in that way, we go alone. Our scripture this evening finds Jesus alone and isolated in the wilderness. The image of wilderness in, throughout the Bible is coded language. There wouldn't have been a physical location that early readers and hearers of this story would have known Instead, wilderness is a catch-all term used to describe that which is unknown, unseen, which is therefore unsafe in its unknownness. Chelsea preached a few weeks ago, and in her sermon, she said that sometimes we can only see those things which we've seen before. Wilderness is all that we have not seen. The wilderness is what lies beyond the horizons of our periphery. Matthew tells us that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, the same Spirit who, a chapter earlier, descended on Jesus like a dove, who anointed and called and sent him. The Spirit of God descends on us, too, to claim us, to reveal to us and to the world our true identity, beloved, redeemed, anointed, empowered, called, and sent. And so, 
after Jesus was baptized, he was led by the Spirit into that which lay beyond the horizons of his periphery. And so too are we. I'd like to be careful and clear here as I draw parallels to what Jesus experienced and what we experienced that we are not Jesus. That might be a surprise to you. I don't know. Um, but we're not God. But Jesus is. And he put skin on and he lived among us for a multitude of reasons, one of which was to show us the way to live. And so we learn from the way he lived. When we find ourselves in the wilderness, we have an example of how to be faithful there. Jesus spends 40 days in this strange and dangerous place. He doesn't eat. Famished, he nears the end of his time. He can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Hope for the close of his ordeal illuminates his darkness. And it is precisely, and I would bet intentionally, in this most vulnerable place that the tempter appears. I don't want to get bogged down in a conversation about whether or not there exists an anthropomorphic red devil with horns and a tail and a pitchfork or bogged down in the mechanics of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. For better or for worse, I'm not convinced of the existence of that little red devil with a pointy tail, but I do very much believe in evil. The forces of evil are at work in our world every day. Evil rears its ugly head. It gets into our own lives and the lives of those we love. Whatever the mechanism of their existence, the powers of evil are embedded in some of the very structures we've built in our world. We live in a world of divided priorities, attention, and reality. This passage tells us that God walked among us and still evil held court in his presence. I have read and reread the Harry Potter series probably 15 times, which my husband can attest to. I first encountered Harry and his friends when I was 11. The series taught me the value of friendship, how to persevere in the face of hard times, and to choose good in the face of evil, even when that choice is unspeakably hard. The series got me through the isolation of mean girls and the heartbreak of unrequited crushes and a whole host of other harder and uglier things through the course of my adolescence, and so I'm drawn again and again to that straggly teenager with a penchant for rule-breaking and his ragtag group of friends when I consider Jesus, a man with a ragtag group of friends who's also in the habit of breaking rules. There is a story revealed to the readers in the seventh and final book of the Harry Potter series, The Deathly Hallows. Now, I might spoil something for you if you haven't read the book, so consider yourselves warned, although you've had like eight solid years to pick it up, so I don't know. The story is the tale of three brothers. These brothers encounter a river with rushing water on their path, and the bridge has collapsed. Being magic, they simply conjure a bridge to pass. But death usually waits there at that river, and death doesn't appreciate being robbed of three victims, and so death meets them halfway across. Death is not pleased that he's been robbed, so he tricks the brothers and tells them to ask for anything they wish since they've defeated him. The first brother asks for an unbeatable wand, an unbeatable weapon, and so he's granted it to great success until it's stolen from him in the dead of night after another man slits his throat and death claims the first brother. The second brother takes a stone from the river and asks that it be turned into a stone that can resurrect the dead. He uses that stone to bring back his lost love, but she is changed, a shadow of her former self, and he dies driven to madness and death claims the second brother. The third brother asks for a way to be concealed from prying and wandering eyes, and so death hands over a cloak 
of invisibility. Death searches high and low for years for this third brother, but he cannot find him until that brother at a ripe old age takes off the cloak and greets death like an old friend. The way that Jesus is tempted is not so unlike the way the brothers were by their tempter's offers. They're tempted by power, happiness, and anonymity, a way to defeat death. Jesus, too, is tempted with these offers, and his tempter, the ultimate tempter, goes after who he is at his core, his identity. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. But it is precisely because Jesus is the Son of God that he resists. The cunning tempter changes his tactics, but the heart of the matter remains the same. If you're the Son of God, then throw yourself from this high point. Surely angels will rescue you. Jesus resists again. It is precisely because he knows his identity that he does not need to prove it, at least not in this way. Undeterred, a third time, the tempter comes at Jesus with all he's got. All Jesus has to do is deny his identity, bow and worship Satan. Just put on that cloak of invisibility, hide your true self, and all you see will be yours. This is the breaking point. Jesus sends the devil away, and the angels tend to him. Jesus fully human, knew what we confess in the Westminster Catechism, that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. To worship anyone or anything other than God would be to deny our true purpose and our true identity. It's easy to remember that, to remember our identity, our calling, our anointing in a space like this where we are gathered with so many saints, where symbols of font and table are ever-present. It's so easy to forget that when we're sent from here, back out into the unknown, the unsafe. Our temptations are not so different from those of Christ. Deny your identity, they say. All wealth and power and happiness can be yours. I don't know about you, but I'm given more than one opportunity to deny my identity a day, an hour. So as you go, remember that you have been remembered. At the table where we gather, you have been rejoined, reattached, remembered to the body of Christ. Like Von Williams' traveler, in many ways we set off on this journey alone. But we also set off as remembered parts of the body of Jesus Christ, and in that way, we do not go alone. We may find comfort knowing that others are out there too, that Jesus himself encountered what we face. Jesus knew real hunger and thirst. Jesus knew the violence that is intimidation and manipulation. Jesus knew what it was to be tempted with nearly limitless power. So perhaps we can remember those who hunger for bread for today but cannot eat because of the stigma attached to poverty, homelessness, and hunger. Perhaps we can remember those who live in a place of constant terror and fear but find no reprieve because of government sanctions or an abusive partner. Perhaps we can even remember those who are shown power and glory beyond imagining those who, instead of saying, away with you, Satan, instead answer, yes, I want that, whatever the cost, because that is its own kind of sadness. That is its own kind of isolation and wilderness. In saying yes to limitless power, you are robbed of your true identity as beloved, redeemed, anointed, empowered, called, and sent. There is, perhaps, no greater wilderness than that. 
The kind of solidarity we encounter in the wilderness is a kind of solidarity many of us have found in the waters of baptism that we proclaim each week at this table. Each of us, weary travelers who have trod the upward and the downward slope, gather with Christ and with the saints present and with the saints who have gone before. But our gathering, our remembering goes beyond that. We gather, too, with the saints who planted seeds of grain, whose hands plucked grapes from their vines. We gather with those factory workers who make the plastic which contains and preserves our ordinary elements, with those drivers who carry our holy meal across the long haul, with those hands that stock supermarket shelves. We gather with those who carved this table, who formed these vessels. We gather with those who will sweep these floors long after we've supped and gone. Their stories are inextricably linked to ours and ours to one another in this holy mystery, this holy meal. Out of the waters of baptism we are called, and into the wilderness we are led. We come back to this table every so often, our perspectives a little broader. We come, weary travelers, to be strengthened and encouraged and reminded that we are beloved, redeemed, anointed, empowered, called, and especially that we are sent sent to those places which lie beyond the horizons of our periphery. In some ways, all of life is a wilderness journey. Thanks be to God that we do not go alone. Amen.